Okay, everybody, good morning and thank you very much for joining us on our webinar this morning. I, I'm delighted that you could make it and just um, uh, really pleased to have you here. Um, so just while before we start, I would just like to run through a little bit of housekeeping with you if I can. I just want to check the audio with you, please, if you may. Um, just drop something into the panel on the right hand side, just a little put your hand up or just type a little note in the questions box um, just to let me know that you can hear us all okay. Um, and while you're doing that, I'd just like to say that please do feel free to ask questions throughout um, of, of myself or either of the presenters. I'll come on to in a moment. We shall be finishing by 11.30 today um, and we shall very much try and keep to time. Uh, and we're going to be recording the webinar as well, which will be ending um, shortly after the event. Uh, I'm also going to put some um, next steps together at the end of the presentation and um, just to continue our conversation with you. So, who's on the call today? Well, we've got Paul Harris from the Welfare Reform Club, who's joining us, and Devon Galani from Policy and Practice. And uh, in the way of webinars, it's always nice to see faces. So, this is this is who you're talking to today. He'll be talking to you today. So, a little bit about Paul. Um, I, I'm sure many of you know Paul already. He worked for the DWP for 38 years. Uh, and most of his career has been spent on uh, welfare, welfare benefits policy and delivery. Um, he has worked with local authority on the uh, Universal Credit Pilot and CTRS and also Quality Assurance of Welfare Reform Programmes. And I probably don't really need to say much more about Paul than that. Um, equally, Devon Galani, I'm sure many of you will know, um, Devon is the Director of Policy and Practice and also the Welfare Reform Club with Paul. He is an expert on welfare policy, um, in particular the recent welfare reform, and he was part of the team that developed Universal Credit at the Centre for Social Justice. Um, Devon has written extensively on welfare policy, government spending and employment. So a little bit about the Welfare Reform Club, for those of you who may, who may not know, and the Welfare Reform Club was founded by Paul, Malcolm Gardner and Devon Galani in uh, 2012. Uh, and its remit is to help local authorities to implement common sense positive solutions that help citizens to lead independent, secure lives. And I'd just like to shout out as well, uh, one really interesting and exciting element of the Welfare Reform Club is the Visionary Network, um, which is a new way to provide continual professional development for local authorities, professionals. It's, it's kind of like an online um, community of like-minded professionals, and they have a great uh, series of seminars uh, that actually count towards your non-accredited elements of your CPD. So do check out the Welfare Reform Club website uh, and sign up for the Visionary Network for future events. Policy and Practice um, is an organisation, it's a solid social policy software and consulting business and we were founded by Devon Galani um, in, in 2012 uh, and uh, this, when Universal Credit was adopted, when Devon uh, worked on it with the team at the Centre for Social Justice, um, he saw this as a really uh, a unique opportunity that not many people get in the policy world, which is to actually have your idea to be put into practice. So he had two options. He could move on to the next policy report, uh, or he could try and make Universal Credit work. So he founded Policy and Practice to address that gap between policy and practice. And we do this in a variety of different ways. Uh, we do policy research, we also do consultancy work, mostly for local authorities um, to help them deliver better and better understand the impact of welfare reform or help them develop their own schemes. And we also have a range of outcome-based software tools which we're going to talk a little bit about today, um, like our universal benefit and budgeting calculators. And these help our clients to be more effective in supporting customers to deliver policy intent. So that's a little bit about the organisations. Today's agenda, like I say, it's comprehensive. We have a lot to get through, um, but primarily we're going to be talking about three different areas. The first is the welfare cuts and their likely impact on your residents. The second is how uh, is, is about changing behaviour and changing culture. And the third is about your role um, as a local authority. So to put it into context, and, and I'm going to hand over shortly to Paul, who's going to talk about this in much more detail, £12 billion of welfare savings. Um, that we're going to hear more about in the budget uh, in July. And also Universal Credit, Devon's going to talk a little bit more about that. But, but what can you do about it is, is the important point. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul now, who's going to take you through the 12th Over to you. Okay, well, let's uh, let's start again. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Devon. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, just to uh, 
show you what I want to talk about this morning. Um, I'll talk about what the what I think the government believe is their mandate now, and then uh, talk about finding the 12 billion, uh, which remember is over two years. That's uh, that makes the challenge even greater because it's by 2017-18. Um, so a bit about the story so far, uh, what's in the manifesto, and then looking at some of the options uh, and winding up uh, with a conclusion. So uh, if we can move on uh, to just talk about the mandate. The government, um, perhaps a bit unexpectedly, even um, for them, um, of course, are a majority government, um, so they will think they have a really firm mandate to press on with uh, welfare reform. They will certainly <coughs> think they have a mandate to implement the manifesto commitments, which we'll come on to, um, and they have this commitment made to cut the welfare bill by 12 billion over the next two years. Um, DWP, in particular in Duncan Smith, have said that uh, in doing this, um, they want to introduce measures that will um, have some effect on behaviour, uh, rather than just cutting a sort of set percentage of uh, of everyone. Um, and this is quite an important point, and uh, will uh, lead on to some further discussion when uh, Devon speaks later, uh, because. Um, it's, it would be interesting to see what uh, changes are brought about, um, you know, how people uh, do change their behaviour, um, and we really do need to know uh, where the impact will fall. So there will be a, a, a real drive to attack uh, benefit dependency um, and indeed benefit tourism, which we'll touch on. Um, and of course, even more emphasis on getting people into work. Um, that's always been um, the key priority, but it, uh, and that will remain so. Uh, universal credit. I think they'll have have a mandate to roll that out. Um, but just one um, one note here: uh, the One Nation approach, which David Cameron and others have talked about, um, may just have some moderating impact here. They may uh, have not been expecting in a way to uh, have to in implement their 12 billion pounds cuts so they perhaps thought they would be in coalition uh, again and and they wouldn't have to do it quite as much as um, the commitment now means so let's uh, you know it will be interesting to see how how things pan out so if we move on quickly to um, the uh, story so far um, I say easy, I mean nothing is easy in this uh, agenda really, um, but um, the context of course is that there have been major cuts already. Um, if you take out the, the measures which are simply about um, you know, the up rating, um, then 15 billion pounds of cuts. Not all of that has been achieved in practice, or not yet. Um, quite a lot um, was promised uh, by way of um, reform to ESA, personal independence payments, uh, not all of that has, as you know, has gone that well, so, you know, there are still savings to be had there. Um, but nevertheless, £15 billion has been um, effectively uh, taken out of um, the welfare bill. Um, but of course, the welfare, other reasons, demographic factors and other factors have meant that welfare spending is still increasing. Um, uh, it's uh, reducing its proportion of GDP, but uh, still growing in real terms. So we're still talking about uh, roughly 220 billion pounds. The government have committed not to touch state pensions and universal pension benefits uh, in this uh, 12 billion, in finding 12 billion. Um, so that's about 95 billion. So uh, we're talking really about 10% of the working age uh, budget that uh, will need to be found, and that is quite a big chunk. Um, about 1.2 billion has been found so far, so you know we we only got another 10 billion to go. Um, let's just see what manifesto commitments uh, were. If we go on to the next slide.
Um, most working age benefits will be frozen for a couple of years, um, so there won't be a net rating um, for those. Um, that will save a billion and will mean a 1.4% real cut under the current inflation forecast. Uh, and then there's reducing the benefits cap from 26,000 uh, to 23,000. Um, uh, quite a few families will lose quite a big chunk of money, of course, uh, through this measure, um, but it doesn't affect that many. So the savings will only amount to uh, about 0.1 billion. Um, and again, removing housing benefit from the 18 to 20 year olds is a specific measure designed to um, strengthen work incentives, affect behaviours, uh, but is only again a fairly modest um, uh, saving because of the comparatively few numbers affected. So uh, those are the manifesto commitments. Um, let's look at the spending now that is not protected and where this 12 billion has to come from. If we move on. This chart shows you um, the spending where the 12 billion could uh, be found. Um, and you'll see that uh, tax credits on 30 billion uh, in the blue, um, that is the biggest single item. Um, and uh, that is probably a big clue as to where um, some of the savings will be found. You've then got housing benefits, uh, 16 uh, billion on social sector, uh, 10 on private sector, so again, a massive chunk of spending. Disability benefits, possibility, 22 billion, uh, and then you've got incapacity benefits, child benefit. Um, again, child benefit um, could be an area of, of some cuts. But you'll see that um, pension credit, which is not, not actually protected, uh, job seekers allowance, income support, other bits and pieces don't really account for that much. So I don't think, you know, you, you might get some savings there, but you're not going to get a lot. So let's look at what I've called the sort of easier options. Uh, and these are things which could be sort of disguised as savings, if you like. Um, the government, as I said, will be getting more people into work. There's no doubt about that. They'll be getting people off benefits and into work. Um, and they've got a, you know, a pretty good record on that. Um, the, well, the coalition government have got a pretty good record, um, essentially, in terms of getting people into work. Um, but you know, this wouldn't count really because um, employment forecasts already, um, you know, take into account any proposed shifts in in, uh, in the labour market. Um, so it's not; it doesn't really count as a cash cut. It could be part of the story, but I don't think it will be. Um, you know, I don't think they can argue that it's part of the 12 billion. And then um, reducing fraud and error and benefit tourism are likely. Uh, areas for action, but whether they really um, account, will, will lead to any savings, we'll come uh, in, to those in a bit more detail in a minute. There is an overall welfare cap, um, which um, as you know, not, not to be confused with the benefits cap, but it sets a limit on the overall spending for uh, a good portion of the welfare bill, and if it looks as though that spending is going to increase beyond the limit, then um, there has to be a report to Parliament and specific measures taken um, or the extra spending uh, specifically agreed. But it doesn't help actually to find specific areas, you've still got to do that uh, separately. Um, there will be some cuts that um, I've already, as I mentioned earlier, the ESA incapacity benefit which hasn't really been fully implemented yet. Um, but they can't really claim those as new savings because they've already been scored. So, as I say, this, all of this stuff may end up as part of the story, but it won't uh, be a very convincing one. And if we just look at fraud and error, um, for example, and uh, it's the columns on the right hand side I just want to br briefly draw your attention to. Uh, we're looking here uh, at a chart from 2005 6 to 2013 14. Um, and you'll see that um, fraud and error um, uh, was 2.1% overall in 2005.6 and it's 2.1% in 2013-14. 
fluctuates a bit, but essentially has been around that. The individual components change around a bit, um, and um, you know, official error is is down, um, but um, it it doesn't shift. It doesn't it doesn't seem it's very difficult to get um, you know uh, to introduce measures that have a real impact on that. Um, universal credit arguably will, um, but the, any savings from um, from that will already have been uh, taken into account in the universal credit business case, so they can't be scored as part of the 12 billion either. And then benefit tourism, um, obviously this is uh, extremely topical at the moment, and um, some benefits are already restricted for job seekers, um, so basically um, you can't claim job seekers allowance, housing benefit and so on for three months uh, if you're a job seeker. Um, the attention is now focused on those who are in work um, and to try and remove the financial assessment or reduce it, uh, the financial incentive for those um, lower paid and lower skilled workers to come uh, to Britain. So uh, the, the, the negotiations, of course, underway, um, and what the government would like to do is introduce a four-year period before migrants, EU migrants, can claim tax credits and child benefit, um, and end the uh, receipt of child benefit and child tax credit um, if the migrant's child is living abroad. Um, so uh, these are things that could well come into play. Um, the timing is a bit uncertain, but really uh, not likely to achieve a lot of savings in the next two years unless you suddenly took away a lot of uh, existing benefit recipients' money, which I, you know, I'm not sure that, that could be done very easily. So um, let's move on. Um, a bit more difficult now, a bit more difficult territory, but one that's very familiar, uh, familiar to uh, most of you, of course, and housing benefit expenditure. Uh, is undoubtedly going to feature uh, as part of finding this 12, point, uh, 12 billion. It's still increasing. Um, obviously, there have been cuts. I think roughly about two billion pounds worth of cuts over the last five years. Um, but uh, expenditure still increases because of pressures from elsewhere. Um, social sector rents can increase more than inflation. That's a government policy. Um, more people are renting in the private rented sector for obvious reasons. Uh, and more low people, uh, low paid people in work are getting housing benefit. So the bill is increasing um, despite the cuts that have already been made. Uh, we've got the, uh, the one uh, measure that's already promised um, to remove housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds. We could extend that. Uh, the government could think they could extend that um, maybe uh, and include more people, uh, not just GSA. And then there's perhaps the option that was uh, tried and it was introduced um, but then withdrawn in 2010 uh, and then it was uh, the measure was to, um, to reduce for JSA claimants housing benefits by 10% after 12 months. Then that, uh, that was estimated, it's a fairly modest version of it, uh, it's estimated to save 100 million. If you um, now, if you actually uh, tried to um, chop 10% off all um, housing benefit recipients, that would be extremely difficult. But if you, if you were going to go down that route, um, then uh, theoretically you could save up to 2.5 billion. So it is, um, it is, you know, an option that is likely to feature in some form or other. And the idea is that it would, generally speaking, give people an incentive to move to cheaper accommodation. The other factor with housing benefit is that, as you well know, um, to uh, deal with some of the cuts that have already taken place, particularly in the social rented sector, um, then uh, there have been substantial increases in the DHP budget, it's now reduced again, but you know, substantial increases. That could be, I mean, I think that's generally regarded as a very good fallback take the sting out of the tail if you like um, and so um, that well could feature and that's important for local authorities because uh, it could mean you know more uh, more activity on the welfare front for, for you in that respect. Um, there may be other um, other 
behavior type measures that are considered. Um, there was something in the manifesto about looking at benefit penalties for those uh, addicted claimants of one sort or another who refuse treatment. Um, but again, not likely to be easy and not likely to produce a lot of savings. But um, the big one would be getting five billion out of reducing the child element of child tax credit um, has been increased a lot over uh, the last um, decade or so, uh, since 2003, uh, and this would take it back to its sort of real terms level. Uh, so it's a big, uh, I mean, a big chunk. Um, it would mean affecting low-paid um, people and also people and families with children. It would affect child poverty clearly. Uh, but that looks to me to be a, a front runner, despite the impact on universal credit. Um, more difficult options still may be something around taxing uh, some of the disability benefits. Um, that could mean um, looking at DLA, personal independence payments, and uh, making them taxable. That would save a billion and a half. Child benefit has been mentioned, as we saw before, there are various options. Uh, you could sort of effectively abolish it and compensate people through universal credit, or you could make the amount for the first child the same as the amount for, this, for the subsequent children. Uh, measures of that sort, um, the, 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 the yeah, really um, <clears throat> big option, the abol abolishing child benefits, uh, would save you five billion. But the issue here is that um, David Cameron seems to have said, or made it pretty clear, um, that child benefit won't be cut. Um, so it would be very awkward politically to go back on that. So where does that leave us? Um, conclusion is that um, it's going to remain difficult to find this, this uh, amount of savings. The reductions in welfare spend in the last five years, as you well know, have created real uh, difficulties in some areas. And some of them have not even been realized yet. So there's, there's a way to go. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if um, some of the 12 billion is sort of um, talked of in terms of things that, um, that shouldn't really be there in a sense, they shouldn't really count, maybe something about uh, the narrative of getting more people into work. Um, don't be surprised to find uh, the government coming out with something like that um, because you know, it will be difficult to actually get to 12 billion. I do think that despite um, you know, despite the link with universal credit um, and affecting people in work, cutting tax credits is um, likely to feature. It is, um, of course, one of the biggest flagship labour policies from uh, 2003, uh, and so you know they they would argue that it's just removing uh, over generous provision that, um, the that the previous government made. But housing benefit is also likely to feature. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, that might be tied in with, uh, you know, more moves on localization, um, but particularly with the discussion of housing bank payments. As I say, I think that is likely to um, increase again over the, the coming years, particularly if you know fairly major measures are taken to reduce housing benefit expenditure. So that's all we know at the moment. That's all I can uh, um, say. Um, and uh, let's see what happens. We will know a bit more perhaps at the budget on the 8th of July. But I hope that's a useful uh, counter through the, uh, the agenda as it is at, uh, just, at now, as it, just at present. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we did have a, a poll to be set up at the moment. I'm not sure whether Janet can, can send that out now that we have been, uh, now, now that the uh, presentation has been handed over to me. Oh, it looks like she can. And Janet, feel free to unmute yourself and we'll see how the reception is in Donegal, where you are. Um, okay. But I guess it would be great if, oh, there you are. Over to you, Janet. Yeah, so thank you very much, Devon, and thank you, Paul. So uh, what we have here is just a very, very quick poll. Um, uh, Paul mentioned there that we will obviously know much more after the budget on the 8th of July, and we're going to do some analysis of, uh, of, what, of uh, the welfare reform elements of the budget. Um, so please do um, just click the poll now if you'd like to receive our analysis. 
uh, after the uh, budget on the 8th of July. And I think you can do that just by clicking your screen and that will tell me, um, I see everybody's doing it, you know how polls work, thank you very much. And so while that's still happening, um, that, that tells me uh, who to send the, that information to, so that's brilliant. Thank you very much and uh, I'll just give it a couple more seconds and then I'll close the poll. That's brilliant. I think everybody's done now. That's great. Thanks ever so much. So I'm going to close the poll and then we're going to hand back and Devin's going to continue now on his part of the presentation. Thanks very much, everybody. Great. Thanks so much, Janet. And thanks everyone for voting. Uh, quite a lot more work for us to do on July 7th, 8th and 9th before I go on holiday on the 10th. <laughs> so uh, fantastic. Um, but we are looking forward to, to doing that and, and some of the reasons why will become apparent in the rest of the presentation. But I guess what I wanted to talk about first of all was to um, give a quick update on the other side of the, of the story. So alongside cuts, there's also the rollout of universal credit. It feels a little bit deja vu, a very similar story to five years ago, but it does feel like um, uh, on universal credit at least uh, some lessons have been learned. But um, I guess the proof will be in the pudding. What I thought I'd do is give a quick update, a, a quick progress update on where the department is with universal credit and their plans for rollout and, and how realistic those are. Then I thought what I'd do is give a quick update, a very short summary of uh, the impact that Universal Credit is expected to have on your residents um, in aggregate and also at a household level. And what I wanted to finish off with was a quick story of kind of how local authorities can make sense of some of what Paul's talked about, so the changing picture of um, savings that have come, uh, savings that are about to come, uh, and the impact you know, how to understand what is quite a complex and fast-moving environment um, for your residents, how to make sense of it. So first of all, from the National Audit Office, um, I, I guess the picture on universal credit, aside from the very first uh, announcement around universal credit, where you see, again, essentially what they said was a, was a very rapid rollout right from the outset, and I think some of that was partly politically driven, really just to get the cogs of the um, Whitehall machine moving. But effectively since then, they've changed the narrative um, and said actually slow and steady is the way to go with rolling out a program um, as important and at such a large scale as universal credit, which I think broadly most people agree makes a lot of sense. So um, this is kind of where they expected to be um, in 2013, that's been revised a little bit further to 2014, uh, to these 2014 estimates. Um, with a small number essentially accelerating the rollout all the way through to April um, uh, of next year, April 2016, uh, and then accelerating. Uh, and the next slide explains why they expect to be able to accelerate. So roll out across the country right through to April 2016, uh, and some of the people on the call will, will have seen universal credit affect some of their local residents, albeit not very many to date. Um, but the reason acceleration might be possible is um, the digital service. And it's important to recognize that scaling up and rapid scaling up depends very much on having the IT infrastructure in place and having it um, work in such a way that it does deliver on the policy intent. Now, the timescales for that uh, to make universal credit scalable um, means finishing the digital service currently live only in one area in Sutton. Um, and the plan is for that to be, um, be, be ready to scale up around November 2015, but for that process, it essentially for, for that process only to be complete in May 2016. So that's when you might see um, a, a faster acceleration of universal credit, migration of um, current benefits recipients rather than just um, people who have been recently made unemployed moving on to universal credit. You might see some migration uh, probably in 2016, uh, spring 2016 at the earliest. Um, but after that, you could see a rapid scaling up. So um, a quick question here, again. Um, it would be helpful for us to know as well, um, just given the, the feedback on the poll, which is that most of you would like to see some analysis post-budget. Um, do you just, just type it in uh, into the question box or into the, the chat box to say, what, what do you consider will be your biggest challenge with welfare reform? Um, it's helpful for us to know so we can tailor um, our content and some of our work. So do take a quick moment. Um, I'll give you 20 or 30 seconds or so, but you can type this in as we, as I go through as it comes to you, so, so no rush. But um, do say what you think, having talked about the, the cuts to date and about universal credit, what you consider will be your biggest challenge with welfare reform at a local level. 
uh, could be that we've missed it entirely. So uh, always helpful for us to understand. So moving on from the story so far, uh, the rollout of universal credit, I thought what I'd talk about is some of the policy impacts. Uh, this is based on a report that um, many of you will be aware of that we wrote with the support of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, where we looked at the impact that universal credit was likely to have in three areas, pockets, prospects, and places. Um, pockets effectively means the amount of money that people have in their pockets. Prospects means uh, they're likely, uh, how likely they are to um, move into work or increase their earnings from work um, as a result of this policy. And Places looks at the whole kind of array of support that might be available to support residents. What we found was that um, looking at a whole range of different uh, bits of analysis from the DWP, from the uh, independent organizations like the Institute for Fiscal Studies and the OECD as well, and throwing a little bit of our own analysis in there as well, is that universal credit was likely to have, in aggregate, a broadly positive impact on the money that people had in their pockets. So in aggregate, each household would be £16 per month better off once universal credit was fully rolled out. This doesn't take into account any of the other um, changes that Paul was talking about. It's just looking at universal credit in isolation. So this is perhaps uh, some, some good news uh, amidst uh, a very stormy sea uh, for your residents in, in, who are uh, welfare beneficiaries. Um, but the picture itself is quite complex. So an aggregate household is £16 per month better off. but. Um, a large number of people are, uh, the picture is mixed, so of those households, 3.1 million people are better off with more money in their pocket, but 2.1 million people are worse off. Um, and the drivers of that are quite complex, so it's not just particular household types or people on particular levels of earnings, it, it varies by, by both of those factors. Um, so how much income you have, the type of household you are, which again creates quite a complex picture. Uh, the drivers of, of being better off primarily are uh, increased take-up um, and uh, people on low earnings uh, getting to keep more of, their, more of their income from work in particular. So that's the impact on pockets, so good overall but quite a mixed picture when you get under the, under the bonnet. On prospects, again, a good picture overall, so universal credit is expected to increase the number of hours worked by one to two and a half million hours per week. But again, under the bonnet, quite a complicated picture. So one and a half million people will be will keep an additional 14 pence in the pound. 2.1 million people will keep four pence less in the pound for the next pound that they earn. Now that's important because um, those 2.1 million people are typically households higher up the income distribution. So although for the next pound they earn, they'll be they'll, they'll keep four pence less. They have benefited from being able to keep more of their earnings earlier on in the income distribution. So they could be better off um, in terms of pockets, uh, if not in terms of prospects. Um, and again, that's skewed toward the lower end of the income distribution. So most of those people that see a 14 pence in the pound increase or, or you know, a high increase in, in the amount of uh, earnings they get to keep, they're typically those at the lower end of the income distribution, those just moving into work or those on low hours uh, or in, and low earnings in particular. And in terms of places, you'll be aware of um, universal support delivered locally. Now, Paul and I are uh, part of the team evaluating that uh, with inclusion uh, on behalf of the Department for Working Pensions, so I won't say too much about that other than to say that there will be uh, information coming out from the DWP on that front uh, in due course. Uh, but it is an important aspect of universal credit to have that local support in place. Um, so, I've Paul's given the narrative of um, welfare savings, and I've given a bit of a narrative around universal credit, and I just thought I'd pause here and say, kind of, uh, ask the question um, rhetorically, and say, what does this mean for you, um, and what can you do about it? So, recap of the situation as I see it, and, and do feel free to add comments if you if you see it differently. But local authorities face lots of difficult choices. Um, they'll be overseeing an additional 12 billion pounds of cuts, uh, in addition to those that were made in the last Parliament alongside reforms that are aimed at changing behaviour, not just universal credit, but perhaps also things, uh, some of the policy intent around uh, discretion, local discretionary payments, you could argue, uh, are partly related to changing behaviour. Um, and the combined impact on, on households is, is changing, complex and confusing. So if you're a resident, uh, you could be affected by more than one of these reforms, and, and you don't care about the impact of one specific reform, it's really the whole picture of what that means for you uh, that you're interested in. 
I think the risk here is that um, households don't get the right support. Um, and that's not just financial support, not just money. I think I think money is obviously a big part of it with discretionary support um, available through, through local authorities. Um, but also support toward independence. And the reason that's important is because if you don't deliver both, there won't be enough available to go around. So we've seen that with discretionary housing payments already. Um, and with local welfare support, there's less uh, local support available, which means that it needs to be better targeted toward those that need the money and those that perhaps can can take some steps uh, toward it need to be supported to take those steps toward independence. I think if local authorities don't do that, they'll see um, their residents feel more and more of the brunt um, and it's going to cost the council and other areas through impacts and other services, so child, uh, children's services or, or the homelessness team, um, uh, just as sort of reasonably straightforward examples of, of where some of the other costs might emerge. So I think from the local authorities we've been, been speaking with, I think there are, there, are, there are three main things that they've been speaking with us about. They need to, um, as local authorities, they need to explain a complex picture to cabinet members. And this is an, um, uh, a straightforward area to get your head around. Um, they need to be able to target and tailor support effectively. Um, and they also need to begin to have a tangible impact on people's behaviors so that financial support can be targeted to those that need the financial support the most. So I want to talk a bit about how we're helping um, some local authorities to do that. And uh, I think the, the rationale for it is, is neatly uh, captured in this quote, which is uh, one from Steve Carey at Leeds City Council, who we did some work with, um, that's shown on the subsequent slides. His question was, uh, his problem was, I can't see whether the people being clobbered by reductions in council tax support or by under occupation or the bedroom tax are the same people that have been clobbered by other reforms. Um, and that's important, that was important to him because it, um, it meant that he wasn't able to make, um, he didn't feel confident uh, in being able to make the right sort of decisions or the properly informed decisions around the local support schemes that Leeds Council were putting in place and he wanted to make sure those plans supported their wider anti-poverty strategy. So we felt we, we might be able to help him with this. Um, one of the things we did, and I'll explain how in a second, but we helped him to explain what is a very complex picture to Cabinet um, by providing a very detailed analysis of welfare reform at a household level. So here's, a, here's an output of some of that analysis. You can see here um, the number of households that have been affected by the benefit cap, the number of households affected by under occupation charge or the, or the bedroom tax, those that are paying rent above the local housing allowance, um, those that are affected by council tax support, um, reductions, um, the impact of universal credit, those households with a lower universal credit entitlement and uh, who may need transitional support, those that may be better off under universal credit. And you can see very quickly how perhaps for these two groups you might target a slightly different message. Um, these households you might want to make them aware of uh, transitional protection in order just to reassure them and avoid panic. These households you might want to actually explain, actually, if you are able, here's some support that's available to support you into work and you will be better off as a result. So you can see how some of this can lead to slightly more tailored communication. And then importantly, we were able to look at the cumulative impact of all of these reforms together. So you can see, and this is, uh, this analysis is broken down by sort of broadly postcode grouping, so you can kind of show the impact locally, but in aggregate to say how many households are affected, uh, aren't affected, those that are affected by one reform, those that are affected by two reforms. And you can see, importantly, you can see at a household level which reforms they are. So this, uh, this sheet doesn't really do the depth of analysis justice. Um, it is at a household level that I think uh, some of this stuff really matters. Um, so some of the key findings from that uh, in one large city, and I I suppose I can tell you that it's Leeds um, right now. We're doing the work for Birmingham City Council as well. Very similar piece of analysis. But we found that universal credit with full transitional protection would bring the local economy 1.6 million pounds each month. Obviously much less once that transitional protection had, um, had, had worn off. Um, and the impact that that had on, on each working age household. Uh, interestingly, one of the statistics I was most surprised taken by was that of the self-employed, only 15% of self-employed households had earnings above the minimum income floor, which means that 85% of self-employed households would be subject to the minimum income floor. And it might mean that there's some targeted work for self-employed households that, that needs to be undertaken. 
Um, so that's the kind of uh, insights you can draw from this analysis. And we were also able to look at forward-looking reform, so two that were topical at the time and, and still are, uh, based on Paul's presentation, is those households that would be affected by a fall in the benefit cap from 26,000 to 23,000. In this, in this case, that effectively doubled the number of households that were capped. Um, and uh, we were also able to uh, understand how many households had 18 to 21 year olds in receipt of housing benefit and also those that might be subject to earn or learn policies or the youth allowance, um, which is another um, uh, change in policy that's been, been announced. And importantly, it's important, I just want to emphasize that it's not just understanding how many people are affected in terms of your traditional impact assessment, but which households are affected. So you can take this down, right down to the household level um, and say, you know, here's a household with an 18 to 21 year old who's in receipt of housing benefit and target support um, or target your letters or target your communications to that household specifically. How do we do this? Um, I'll walk you through this very quickly and do feel free to, to ask questions if we have time we'll, we'll answer them. Um, but it relies on a data set that all local authorities have, SHIBI, the Single Housing Benefit Extract. This is a data set that local authorities have to provide to the DWP um, in order to ensure that housing benefit is paid. Um, so it's quite accurate, um, as accurate as, as can be, given that uh, housing benefit payments are made on the basis of that. Um, we take that data, we clean it up, which takes a little bit of time. That's actually one of the, one of the more challenging pieces. Um, but we clean up that data, um, and that can provide some useful insights as well. We run it through our benefit calculation engine, which I'll try and show you in a second or two. And that's what allows us to see the impact of specific reforms and then we can add those all up uh, to look at the impact of cumulative reforms at a household level. We don't take any personally identifiable information. We um, strip all of that out of uh, SHIB when we get it, but there is a unique identifier, so that can be mapped back by the local authority to the household um, to help you target that support. And the end result is a short report which provides a detailed impact assessment for cabinet members on, on welfare reform um, and informed, targeted and tailored local welfare support, which is the bit that really gets me excited actually changing the way local authorities do things and using what support resources they have available more effectively than they were doing before. Um, so what's that delivered? Um, so so from, from Leeds and Birmingham to date. Um, in Leeds, because they're able to see who was clobbered by different reforms, it led to a change in their council tax support scheme, um, aimed much more around behaviour change and supporting job seekers into work. I'm sure you'll hear more about that as it starts to um, uh, affect residents in Leeds, um, but that's partly based on some of the analysis that we were able to do um, uh, for Steve Carey. Uh, and then the work on the likely impact of universal credit is informing um, action planning um, in, both, in both Leeds and Birmingham in preparing for universal credit, and um, that analysis will kind of, it's, it's the hub, uh, so, so the data that this provides is, is a bit of a, an information hub around how you're targeting and coordinating support locally. Um, and a quick example as well of um, uh, how that can meet a sort of different operational decisions comes from a piece of work we did in Lewisham. So you can see here we sent out different types of letters to um, households affected by benefit cap. Um, and this was tested in a controlled way. Um, and what we found was that your traditional DWP type scary letter saw 53% of people open and respond to that letter. When the tone was changed and it was just made a little bit more friendly, 76% uh, of people responded. Not only did more people respond, but they responded more positively, much more likely to engage and support. And as a result, um, residents had more time to support more people um, who were more, much more engaged in receiving that support, and, and they got more people into work as a result, which led to savings in the homelessness budget. Now, a very quick example of that, which um, I think I do have uh, just enough time for, um, and it's worth mentioning here that we have another webinar um, focused much more on universal credit um, in a couple of weeks' time, which uh, Janet will follow up with you all on in case you'd like to register and, and join that one as well. But um, one of the things I wanted to show you uh, very briefly, and I'll walk you through it very quickly, is the system that we've developed. This is the engine that leads to all of the analysis I was talking about a moment ago, but it can actually be used to communicate the impact of changes on the front line. So um, I'll very quickly show you Aisha. She's a single mother with one child in the northwest of England, in Trafford, let's say. Um, uh, she's got a seven-year-old boy. Click here. You can quickly see her out-of-work entitlements. They're 
are broadly the same under the current system and universal credit. If they weren't, there'd be a notifier to say why. You can see how the calculations are received. So um, here you can see, for example, her housing benefit has been reduced by 14% because she's underoccupied. So all of the information is, uh, behind the calculations is, is shown here, acts as a bit of a training tool for advisors. Now, what if Aisha were to move into work? Here she's moving into a job at the minimum wage of 15 hours a week. You can take into account any costs of work. So for example, if her childcare during school holidays, for example, that could be added into the calculation. Um, but I'll leave that out for now. And you can see that at 15 hours a week, she'd be 106 pounds per month, better off under the current system, which is 24 pounds 40 a week. Under universal credit, at 15 hours, that's much more. So she's 73 pounds 47 pound pence per week, better off under universal credit. So you can see that in this particular instance, it's a better picture under universal credit. But another way in which it's been used is to show that, um, for example, here under the current system, it's because she's working 15 hours, you can show her visually that actually it's at 16 hours, you get this big, this sort of jump in your income. So it's been used by Job Centre Plus staff, for example, to, to work with um, loan parents who are on 12, 14 hours a week to say, speak to, your, speak to your manager and get a few additional hours. And it's also tied into Universal Job Match, so she can look for a job. So it's about now that she's engaged in looking for work, she can look for, let's say, a sales assistant job in Trafford, and that then opens up Universal Job Match. Uh, and that can be recorded here in Action Plan and, and saved, and, and she can print that and take that away for later. So a very quick demonstration, that's, uh, that's integrated with budgeting support and all of the, all of the um, sort of digital and financial support tools that I think residents on Universal Credit are expected to move toward, and the idea was to help advisors to, to support people in a, in a quick and engaging way. Um, so that's the, that's, the, that's the crux of the presentation. I'll hand over to uh, Janet, um, if you unmute yourself, Janet, um, just to wrap up and um, let me know if there are any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Devon. Um, I've just got a couple of questions here. They are around the, um, the Shibi data. Um, first one is, how did you get around the data protection issues from the Shibi data? And the second one was, what do, what do you think the limitations of the Shibi data are? Um, so on the data protection side, um, uh, as I mentioned during the presentation, we don't take any personally identifiable information. We strip all of that out. That all stays with the local authority. So actually what we end up analyzing is, um, is, is, um, uh, isn't affected. There's obviously a data sharing agreement in place and we have all the templates um, to work with local authorities and we, we know because these have been signed off by, by Leeds and Birmingham uh, in the past. Um, what's the second question, Janet? Um, uh, the limitations. So I guess the two limitations yeah. are, um, one, the, the data is static, so it's based on when we got the data, so we can't take into account any changes in circumstances since we last got the data. But we are being able to run that analysis far more uh, far more quickly than we were the first time around. So we're, we're, being, we're, we're able to turn around these reports for Cabinet um, in sort of a, a two-month period instead of um, what was originally much longer. And uh, uh, obviously all, the, all of those, um, I suppose the second limitation is that all of these um, bits of analysis need to be put into context. So for example, just because it says, um, let's say, a large number of loan parents are worse off under universal credit, you need to look at why that's the case and what we, I mean, that was, a, that was a finding in Leeds and one of the things we found was that actually a lot of those loan parents were worse off just by a couple of pounds or a couple of pence at the 16, 17 hour point. Um, that need to be put into context and, and there are other drivers there as well. So those loan parents with, with non-dependents were affected by, by universal credit as well. So um, yeah, I guess those, those, are, those are two limitations. Um, but I think the important thing is that um, we're on hand Paul and myself and, and Malcolm and, and Lisa and others to, to put that information into context for you um, and help you to use that information sensibly to the, to the benefit of residents. Great, Devon. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you to everybody for um, uh, sharing your challenges uh, with us. Um, the, the, I suppose the most important, uh, the, the most interesting thing, just looking at them very briefly, is how different they all seem to be. 
Um, so I shall I shall be writing them up and uh, putting them to Paul and Devon and getting their reflections on your challenges and sending them out after the webinar because I think it it will be interesting I imagine for people to share different challenges with each other. Um, so if we can move on then um, and we can start to wrap up and just uh, take a look at uh, what we actually covered today. Devon, if you could move to the to the next slide. So really what we covered today uh, is the situation, which is, uh, as Paul outlined, the £12 billion pounds of cuts that are coming, uh, and also universal credit and the role that universal credit plays within that. And the problem then is you know, that, that local authorities have lots of difficult choices um, that have a complex impact on households. And the implication being that households won't get the right support, both in terms of cash and support to independence, as Devon talked about, without both. Uh, there won't be enough money available and it will cost the council. Um, so the need, therefore, um, that, that, uh, that is there for local authorities is to explain a complex picture to Cabinet uh, and to target and tailor support effectively. And this can be done, as Devon uh, talked about, the example with the Leeds in Birmingham the, using the SHIBI data. This can be done. Um, and it can also have an impact on behaviour as well. Um, a challenging situation, uh, but one that can be uh, can be looked through. So the next steps then, um, we're going to wrap up now. Unless anybody's got any questions that they want to quickly pop into the question panel in the in, in the pane uh, on the right hand side. What I can do now is tell you that the next steps we're going to do, we're going to email out this webinar recording. And apologies for everybody from the very beginning. I think you could hear Devon and Paul and I just having our quick pre-webinar chat. So hopefully <laughs> that either gave you a bit of a yeah. tool. Um, but maybe we'll edit that bit out for, for sending it on to people afterwards. Um, so we'll send you the recording and we'll also send you a copy of the detailed case study uh, that we've got. Uh, just outlining in a bit more detail the information that Devon went through there on the Shibi stuff. Um, we also, as Devon did touch on, uh, we have some more webinars coming up, um, Dates for Your Diary, um, which is on the next slide, Devon. Um, the one is on the uh, housing associations. So how can housing associations respond to another round of welfare reform? So as you can gather, that is um, tailored to housing associations. We've got Bill Irvin from um, Universal Credit Advice as our guest speaker there. I think um, perhaps many in the housing association sector will know Bill. Um, and we're also going to talk in a lot more detail about universal credit in that particular webinar as well. That's on the 1st of July, 10.30 to 11.30. And then we're also going to do a much more detailed demonstration of the software that uh, Devon did a quick canter through there with lots of different uh, examples. And we're going to do that again uh, on Thursday, the 9th of July, 10.30 to 11.30. But you can find out more details of the webinars and you can register yourself if you go to the policy and practice website and just look on the main navigation for events. All of the details are there and you can sign up there. So we'd love to see you. We'd love, we'd love for you to join us. And all that remains, I think, now is for me to say thank you very much um, to our speakers. So that's Paul from Paul Howarth from the Welfare Reform Club. You can contact Paul at um, paul at welfarereformclub.co.uk or indeed do take a look at the Welfare Reform Club website with details there on the screen. And Devon as well, thank you to Devon. Devon at policyandpractice.co.uk. You can find Devon on Twitter, Devon underscore Galani, um, and also you can see the Policy and Practice website there, policyandpractice.co.uk. Thank you very much, everybody, for all of your time. I cannot believe that we're finishing early, uh, which is great. <laughs> um, you can go on early now and uh, grab a cup of coffee. And thanks, everybody, for attending. And we shall see you very soon. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.